Good afternoon and thank you for joining us. My name is Joanna Gessler and I'm the Vice President of Education and Exhibits at Los Angeles Museum of the Holocaust. It is my pleasure to welcome you to today's program, Anti-Semitism and Mideast Governments Today, a presentation by David, Dr. David Andrew Weinberg. This program is presented by Los Angeles Museum of the Holocaust and the Anti-Defamation League. The Nazis were masters at modern propaganda, disseminating false information to sway public opinion. For example, Julius Streicher was a German politician and publisher of anti-Semitic media. In 1938, Julius Streicher, a German politician, sorry, it, um, he was a host of anti-Semitic children literature to teach children how to hate and warn children not to trust their Jewish peers. For many school-aged children, anti-Semitic books like these were the sole understanding of Jews and Judaism. By teaching children to be prejudiced and to disseminate and to discriminate, the Nazis set the stage for hatred and violence. As anti-Semitism and propaganda did not begin with the Nazis, it also did not end with the Nazis. Speaking us today about how manipulation of education to teach children how to hate is Dr. David Andrew Weinberg, who is the Anti-Defamation League's Washington Director of International Affairs, where he serves as the organization's main point of contact on foreign affair issues for Congress, the administration, and foreign embassies. He is also the organization's lead analyst on government-enabled anti-Semitic incident in the Middle East. Prior to joining the ADL, Dr. Weinberg worked on Gulf issues as a senior fellow at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies and as a professional staff member on Mideast issues at the House Committee on Foreign Affairs. In this capacity, he served on a team of advisors to late Representative Tom Lantos, the only Holocaust survivor to ever serve in US Congress. David grew up in Los Angeles and holds a political science degree from UC Berkeley and MIT. We will have time for questions at the end of David's presentation. So if you have a question, please type it in the Q&A box. And now I'll turn it over to David Weinberg. David, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Jordana. Thank you so much to your colleagues, to the museum, um, to my colleagues in the LA ADL office for um, helping co-organize this. And, and really thank you everybody uh, for joining us here today. Uh, I really appreciate you taking time out of your weeks to, to um, learn and, and talk about these sorts of issues together. So without further ado, I'm going to share my screen um, so we can um, go through this presentation. Uh, and um, I would love to um, spend a lot of time focused on question and answer at the end. So here are two images. Uh, let me know if, if they're not coming through, but uh, here are two images that are on display in gallery two of the museum. These are um, both images um, from Nazi era propaganda aimed at indoctrinating young children with a, um, a slanderous, demonizing, uh, conspiratorial, um, stereotype, stereotypical view of, of Jewish people. So uh, on the left here is an image from a book uh, entitled um, uh, Trust No Fox in the Green Meadow and Trust No Jew on His Oath. And it, it shows side by side these caricatures of a German man and a Jewish man. And, and it says the the German is strong and upright and, and ready for work or a fight, and the Jew is ugly and um, hunched over and, um, and basically unappealing uh, and not willing to work. The other image here is from a, um, another Nazi era book aimed at children called The Poisonous Mushroom. Uh, and, uh, what, what this image is showing is, is a student in front of a classroom of peers saying you can recognize the Jew by his, uh, his form, including his nose, which is uh, sort of like the, the shape of the number six. Both of these are books that were published by Streicher's publishing house. Uh, they're two of the main books aimed at children uh, from that, that um, from that publisher. Uh, additionally, 
there was also a, um, a weekly paper, Der Sturmer, which played a very large role uh, in, in propaganda of this sort as well. Now, to what extent are these, um, these messages, these stereotypes useful for informing uh, how we look at propaganda or indoctrination in, in the present day? Uh, here's an example that I think is striking and disturbing and um, shows that I think some of the staying power of some of these negative physical or conspiratorial stereotypes. So this is an image that was posted by the um, state-owned Qatari news site Al Jazeera on Twitter in 2017 uh, and was subsequently deleted. And it showed a, a similar physical um, stereotype of uh, a negative stereotype of a Jewish person uh, matched with a um, conspiratorial stereotype of this sort. So he's saying my, my global warming climate change scam is working out perfectly for our long-term Talmudic plan of world domination. Now, obviously this sort of messaging is preposterous. Uh, it, um, the fact that it was deleted is, is certainly better than nothing. Um, but I would argue that it, it gives us reason to think a little bit more about these sorts of um, stereotypes and messaging today. Um, and here's, a, here's an overview of what I'll be talking about today to give you a better sense of, of, of what we're looking at. My main argument is that the sorts of images like the two from, uh, from Gallery 2, from those uh, children's books uh, that I showed you already, uh, I think provide a useful tool today for understanding anti-Semitic incitement in the Middle East or elsewhere. Uh, and, and they help give us a sense of um, the fact that this sort of incitement is not just outrageous talk, um, but can have real consequences. And, has a lot of parallels uh, in terms of different tropes, in terms of, of different um, conspiracy theories, uh, which preceded the Nazi era, but also were, were really extensively embodied through these sorts of materials generated uh, by Nazi propagandists, uh, especially by Streicher's publishing house. And, um, and I think provide us with some food for thought uh, for how to understand this sort of incitement today as, as something really serious and, and really um, full spectrum. Uh, now, I'm, I'm not suggesting that this is representative of all Middle Eastern governments. I'm not suggesting that this is um, necessarily representative of viewpoints of people uh, from that region. Uh, I'm mainly interested in, in looking at these particular examples of incitement and thinking about, you know, what does it mean um, and how are, there, how are these parallels um, notable and um, pretty comprehensive. I also want to note for you that, uh, as you might have guessed, uh, some of this is potentially distressing material. Um, so I, I want people to be prepared for that. And uh, you know, if anybody needs to step away from the computer or um, wants to talk about it during the Q and A, um, I certainly uh, welcome that. I'll be talking about some common themes of anti-Semitic uh, tropes and stereotypes, uh, and, and I also want to recommend a resource that ADL put on its website just this year called Anti-Semitism Uncovered, which goes through seven different anti-Semitic myths uh, in in greater depth. Uh, and, and so I use that to, to structure some of the uh, different themes uh, that we'll be looking at today. And then I'll also talk about what some of the, the potential consequences of this sort of um, incitement and indoctrination uh, can, can have for a society. You know, given that this is um, very heavy material, I, I, I want to make sure to close out by noting some positive developments as well. Uh, including um, negative content that is being removed, uh, as well as positive content and positive messages that are, are being um, explored and encouraged as well. Uh, and then we'll, we'll leave lots of time for question and, and answer. 
So here are the two covers of those um, children's books um, from the Sturmer Publishing House by Julia Streicher. Uh, Streicher was um, uh, considered by many the most infamous propagandist of, of the Nazi regime. Um, he was ultimately uh, executed um, as a result of the Nuremberg trials for his role in incitement leading to genocide of the Jewish people. Now, these two books, um, so we've got the, the Poisonous Mushroom here and Trust No Fox here. And again, these were part of a broader um, full spectrum campaign of propaganda um, by Streicher and, um, and the Sturmer Network, particularly the weekly paper um, that his team published. Um, this is an image from Trust No Fox, but it's representative of um, one of the regular practices for this paper, uh, which is that the Nazi regime um, supported the construction of public display cases for this weekly propaganda paper um, in order to spread these sorts of messages far and wide in society. So the first theme that I'm going to talk about today is treachery. And, and this is really, um, it's really embodied in the, um, in the framing of both the title of, of one of the books, which is saying, you know, don't trust a Jew who makes an oath. Uh, and you can also see it in um, really the thesis of the Poisonous Mushroom book as well. Uh, in particular here, it's a mother uh, instructing her son um, that he should not, uh, that he needs to know how to distinguish between an edible mushroom on the one hand and a poisonous toadstool that looks like a, an edible mushroom on the other. And she says, just in the same way that, that it's important to distinguish uh, between, the, um, between a criminal, deceptive Jewish person. Now, a present day example of, of this sort of rhetoric um, as well uh, is something that I came across um, just in recent months. Uh, it's from a textbook used um, primarily in some pub, uh, private schools in Lebanon, uh, but also um, reportedly in some public schools in Lebanon as well. Uh, and it's generated by an educational institution that is um, under the control of the terrorist organization Hezbollah and uh, reported to receive funding from the government of Iran. So this line from a, a religion textbook is a, is a grandfather telling his grandson not to trust Jewish people. Um, he's, he specifically says the Zionists, but he's talking primarily in, in a passage about Jews from the seventh century. And he says, so let's take a lesson um, that the Jews are the enemies of human, the Zionists are the enemies of humanity in the past, present, and future because of their characteristics, including deceit, treason, treachery, and breaking pacts. This sort of um, thematic messaging uh, about Jews also has historical and, and present resonances in terms of a particular uh, myth about Jews in this regard as well. Um, namely something that's, that's called the stab in the back myth. Uh, this is a, um, a um, conspiracy theory or um, scapegoating theory that figured um, significantly in Hitler's Mein Kampf as well as in the Nazis justification uh, for um, demonizing Jews, uh, in particular arguing that Jews, um, that effeminate, uh, weak, or tra traitorous Jews were responsible for the, um, the Axis defeat in World War I. Um, and this is, the image on the left here is a um, art on a postcard that was popular the year after um, the Axis defeat in World War I. Similarly, this is imagery from Cutters Al Jazeera uh, from a political cartoon in recent years in which um, it's suggesting a similar stab in the back from Jews or from uh, the Jewish state. Uh, particularly the instructor is saying you need to look out for uh, a triangle or a triad of evil of um, religious extremists in the Middle East, namely in Turkey or Iran or the terrorism of groups like Al Qaeda and really this um, the message of the cartoon is that's not really what's dangerous. What's dangerous is traitorous Jews. 
The second theme uh, that figures prominently in, in these sorts of messages is, um, is a stereotype about Jewish greed. So this image on the left is from um, the Poisonous Mushroom book, and it shows a, uh, a Jew on a, a bag of money, and it says that money is, is the, the god of the Jews, and that Jews will do anything in order to get money. The fellow on the right here is uh, a very senior Lebanese politician, um, I believe the Speaker of the Parliament. And um, just last year, um, he gave an interview uh, with a local newspaper um, about um, Jews and about Israel and about current affairs. Uh, and in that interview, he decided to tell an anti-Semitic joke in which he said that the the way you tell a Jew is you hold gold in front of the belly of a pregnant woman. And if the fetus reaches out and grabs the gold, then the baby is Jewish. Um, really just the most dehumanizing, outrageous, um, anti-Semitic stereotypes by a government official um, linked to this myth about uh, Jewish greed. The third is um, a conspiracy theory about Jewish power. Um, controlling the world or important sites. So on the left is a, is a political cartoon um, from the Library of Congress um, that dates back to um, Nazi era propaganda. Um, and it shows Winston Churchill, not Jewish, um, with, a, with a Jewish star over his head and as a, a blue octopus gripping the world um, for malicious, controlling, world dominating uh, aims. And on the right is a political cartoon um, from a Qatari newspaper that um, was published in violation of the Qatari government's strict um, press laws, uh, but without any sort of intervention from the Qatari government, um, even when the, the post was reprinted numerous times. Another notable example of this sort of conspiracy theory, it's, it's a bit of a grainy image here, um, but it's from a current Palestinian Authority textbook for school children, uh, in which it talks about Istimara Safafi, which is, uh, translates from Arabic as um, cultural imperialism. And it shows one arm with, the, with um, wearing the American flag and one arm wearing the Israeli flag, gripping the world in control. Now, the fourth such theme is, is a conspiracy, uh, call, conspiracy theory called the blood libel, uh, which goes back to the Middle Ages. Uh, and it, it, it tells that, um, it claims that Jews um, harm non-Jewish children uh, for the purposes of extracting their blood for twisted religious um, rituals or consumption. So this is an image on the left from Der Sturmer. Um, I believe this was the most um, widely distributed uh, edition of, of the, the paper in its history, if I remember correctly. And it depicts a ritual killing of, a, of, of Christian children uh, in this sort of purported uh, ritual. Uh, there's also a similar um, claim in the Trust No Fox book as well uh, about Jews um, killing non-Jewish children for these sorts of twisted purposes. The image on the right is um, translated by the Middle East Media Research Institute, and it shows uh, the host from a, um, a state broadcast um, Egyptian television show uh, in which the, the, um, the guest was, was promoting this sort of conspiracy theory and the host who's pictured here, uh, Hazem Abul Saud says, matzahs with human blood have an effect on one's health. And in response to this sort of allegation, as opposed to, say, disagreeing with it or questioning it. And the, the guest says, of course, yes. So, so a credulous response to this sort of um, really de, you know, evil conspiracy theory. Uh, and then the, another important one with, with deep historical uh, and theological roots is, is the conspiracy theory that Jews collectively are responsible uh, for killing or trying to kill um, Jesus uh, or, um, or other prophets. Uh, so this image um, from the Poisonous Mushroom book um, shows a, a, an adult telling children, remember when you see the cross, 
um, to remember the killing of Jesus by the Jews uh, at Golgotha. Here on the right is um, a screenshot from a sermon uh, at the state-controlled Grand Mosque in Qatar um, that I found uh, several years ago. And um, the, it was broadcast on state TV and the speaker said um, that the, the Jews um, killed the prophets and they tried to kill Christ, uh, son of Mary, and they tried to kill Muhammad, the messenger of Allah, three times. Uh, they have en there's enmity and uh, hatred towards you in their blood and in their veins. So, so really the, the persistence of this sort of conspiracy theory um, in a very different setting. And then um, the last theme that I wanna to talk to you about here today is, is when criticism of Zionism or characterization of Zionism um, is done in a way that it clearly um, continues to embody these sorts of anti-Jewish conspiracy theories simply applied to that different context. Um, so for instance, here is a quote from a, um, a Nazi um, regime uh, magazine, a an article in 1936 saying, Zionism can be understood only through the Jewish prophecies in which Jewry is assured of control over all the goods of this world. Uh, particularly in relation to um, Jews in, in, the, um, in the Holy Land trying to control the world from there. And then this image here on the right is from a Saudi state textbook from the 2018-2019 school year um, that I identified, uh, in which it says the goals of Zionism include the global Jewish government to control the entire world. So again, a very similar message. I think this sort of incitement uh, and demonization has consistent consequences in different settings. So one of the most notable ones is, is I think, embodied by the third book uh, for children that was published by Streicher's Publishing House, uh, which, if I'm remembering the order of the naming correctly, is, um, is called The Poodle, um, Pug, Dachshund, um, Pincher, Dog. Uh, and, and basically what it argues is that um, Jews are a mongrel breed of um, just like a, a, a crossbred dog. Uh, and the book in, in different chapters compares Jews to all kinds of different um, detestable animals as well. Uh, so really dehumanizing Jewish people um, in the most, uh, one of the most fundamental ways, namely comparing them to unappealing animals. We also see this sort of imagery um, in state-enabled contexts in the Middle East today as well. Uh, so for instance, an Iranian um, regime media cartoon um, showing a Hezbollah terrorist leader from Lebanon actually, uh, and depicting Jews or Israelis as um, rats. Another cartoon from Iranian state media um, depicting Jews or the state of Israel as a dog or a wolf. Um, Qatari state media, state owned media showing um, Jews or Jewry or Zionism as um, some sort of monstrous uh, plant. Uh, Iranian state media um, showing Jews or Israel um, as, a, as a snake. Um, Qatari um, state, um, uh, enabled media um, showing Israel or Jewry as um, a bloodthirsty wolf, and then also an Iranian state-sponsored uh, cartoon contest, which depicted Jews as a, as a bat. Now, this sort of um, collective um, dehumanization and demonization, among other things, can lay the groundwork uh, for justifying ethnic cleansing. So these are two images uh, from the Trust No Fox book in which it's, it's basically saying Jews aren't welcome here and showing Jewish migration. And this is an image which I believe has actually been removed from the Iranian state curriculum, but has been um, published for um, school textbooks, at least in, in, uh, as of a couple of years ago. Uh, and it's, a, it's in a story about um, Iranians expelling Zionist Jews from the country. Now there is a, a Jewish community in Iran still, um, but the vast majority of the community uh, left or was driven out um, about four decades ago. 
Another consequence of this sort of incitement uh, is that it militarizes society. It justifies and encourages violence and it encourages young people to engage in this sort of activity. So this is an image um, advocating um, Nazi youth uh, from the, the Trust No Fox book. And this is an image from a, um, a Boy Scout march in Lebanon, the Hezbollah's Mahdi scouts waving flags of the terrorist group and, and marching through a Star of David around a spider. Um, my examination of current Iranian state textbooks also have shown uh, encouragement of, or glorification of child soldiers uh, there as well. And then lastly, there is the, the matter of, of how this can encourage or justify um, killing and, and even genocide. Uh, so the image on the left is, is an addition of Der Strömer. Um, which said that the, the oak tree of Germany can only be healthy um, once um, the rats of Judaism, the vermin, are, are gassed. Something that obviously had horrific um, resonance in terms of eventual um, Nazi actions during the Holocaust. And here's an image from a, a government-generated rally in Iran earlier this year of school children. Uh, after the U.S. killing of Iran's lead um, terrorist official Qasem Soleimani, in which a, a student is saying, we're, we're a generation of, um, we're going to be a generation of new Soleimani's, and uh, we, we're going to confront the Zionists, and we are killers of the, of the Jews. So, you know, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. This is obviously really disturbing stuff. I think it's really serious. I think it's really important for the US government and for the international community to be addressing it seriously. Uh, I do want to provide some counterpoint, uh, some reason for optimism, or at least indication of, of what some positive um, direction can be. So here are some examples of some negative things that are changing, thankfully. So for instance, that passage from a Saudi government published textbook that I showed you from the 2018-2019 school year uh, that we exposed uh, was on the cover of an ADL monograph that we published um, in, I believe, November 2018. And it has these passages that are anti-Semitic, passages that are encouraging violence against women, uh, passages that are, um, that are um, also um, slandering Christianity. The good news is that all three of those passages were cut out this school year from Saudi state textbooks, along with um, a substantial number of the passages that we highlighted as well. A lot of the problematic content still remains, but at least some of these quotes are actually out now, which is good. This is an image of an anti-Semitic uh, book, um, The International Jew by Henry Ford, uh, which was uh, from the United States, uh, but um, complemented um, extensively by Hitler. Uh, this was uh, a book at um, the Cuttery state-sponsored uh, book fair uh, about a year and a half ago. Um, but after ADL and uh, consequently State Department intervention, it was removed. Uh, and in fact, the vast, vast majority of anti-Semitic books from that book fair uh, were all cut out the following year once it was raised seriously with the Qatari government. And then lastly, here's a fellow named Saad bin Atik al Atik, um, a hate preacher from Saudi Arabia who has an international uh, footprint as well. Um, he's, he's preached uh, that called on God to destroy the Jews. Uh, after extensive intervention um, by ADL and others, um, he no longer is allowed to speak at um, an international festival in Dubai. Um, in this, this last year, and he also has been kept off of Saudi state television uh, in the last two years as well. There are also some positive trends throughout the region in other ways as well. Uh, so for instance, uh, you may have heard the news this January, um, the, one of the most senior uh, Muslim leaders, uh, faith leaders in Saudi Arabia, led a delegation of, um, of, of Muslim imams to Auschwitz, um, the most senior um, high-level delegation of the sort in history, to raise awareness about the crimes of the Holocaust and, and to encourage people to learn about it. This is an image down here of um, a forthcoming facility in the United Arab Emirates to be built, um, completed in two years time, called the Abrahamic Faith House, 
which is specifically focused on building solidarity and trust among Muslims and Jews and Christians. And then this is an image from a visit this past year um, to the Jewish community of Morocco by this fellow, the King of Morocco. Uh, one other positive development I can share with you is that um, the presentation I gave to you here today uh, is a variation on a presentation I gave in the last year to senior government, uh, senior government officials from an Arab government uh, who were specifically interested in training uh, for their government officials on how to identify and uh, stop the propagation of anti-Semitism. So, you know, a lot of these things are at a very international level. Um, they're at a very policy focused level, but I wanted to um, close uh, on some suggestions about ways that you can make a difference if you'd like to explore doing so in this regard as well. Um, most notably, I'd encourage you to check out la.adl.org uh, at this Get Involved link, uh, which has a number of different ways that people in the local community can participate in ADL um, trainings, programming, and advocacy. Uh, I also encourage, you know, anytime you see hatred, I think it's worth calling it out, explaining why it's problematic, uh, and encouraging people to do better. Uh, the, the ADL anti-Semitism guide that I highlighted uh, at the beginning of this presentation is at antisemitism.adl.org uh, and can be a useful resource in that regard as well. I'd also encourage you to think about, um, while thinking about and engaging on these sorts of global issues, um, acting locally can be important as well. You can engage with your congressional office on these sorts of issues and ask them, what are you doing to address this sort of incitement? You can engage with um, local community leaders to, to teach them about your story or about what anti-Semitism is or to try and cooperate against it. I also think it's, it's helpful to build bridges with other communities uh, against all forms of hate. Uh, for instance, ADL recently joined in a, a coalition of Muslim and Jewish organizations at the national level, uh, which includes as one of its main principles, um, cooperating to combat anti-Semitism in the Muslim community and also anti-Muslim bigotry in the Jewish community. I think the more that we are willing to be partners against all forms of hate, uh, the more it enables other people to, um, to join with us against anti-Semitism as well in some settings. And I'd also encourage you to think about fighting hate uh, with love. Um, you know, we don't fight fire with fire, we fight fire with water, right? And, and um, to the extent to which we encounter prejudice or incitement of this sort, um, we may get a more willing ear uh, if we, um, give people the benefit of the doubt um, to which we can and, and to try and explain uh, from a place of compassion why these sorts of, of tropes and incitement can be problematic uh, and how we encourage them to, to take a different approach. So you know, with that, I've, I've bombarded you all with a, a lot of content. I really appreciate your patience and, and would love to um, open it up for, for questions uh, with uh, moderation from uh, Jordana. You, were, you, you have the... Um, Moderator's prerogative for the first question, is that right? Um, I do. I'm sorry, I'm just trying to turn on my camera. There it is, okay. Thank you so much, David, that was fascinating. Um, we really appreciate your wealth of knowledge on this information that, as you say, is quite disturbing, but also very appreciative of your positive sort of ending where we can really think about how we can fight hate with love and that we do not fight fire with fire. Um, I, you know, when you look back on propaganda as it developed through the 1930s in Nazi Germany, you can really see the way in which it instructed and manipulated society. And really from 1933 to 1939, changed the overall public opinion of German Jews or Jews in general. And part of this was the development of propaganda, but on the flip side, the suppression of factual information mm -hmm. through book burnings, um, through destruction of non-Nazi media. And so you see both like Nazi propaganda growing and anything that countered their ideology diminishing. And I'm wondering if you get that same sort of balance today and how it works in many of these countries, especially considering the fact that it's 
typically easier for us to access information than it would have been in 1936 in Nazi Germany. So do you see that same sort of balance happening in many of these countries with suppression of uh, factual information and truths? Definitely. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, uh, perhaps one of the most relevant or a telling instance is, is there, were, there were some really interesting um, TV series this, uh, in, during Ramadan this year um, in the Arab world. Uh, and um, with some taboo breaking programs talking about Jewish history in the Arab world, um, talking about um, uh, dialogue with Jews or with Israeli Jews in particular. Um, and there was a really strident pushback uh, from some audiences really criticizing this. Um, but, um, but I think the the, the internet is playing a really, really significant role, uh, especially social media, um, but, but online access to international news sources as well are playing a really significant role in terms of opening up and, and um, affecting the, the ability for governments to really control the media environment in a, in a way to keep out alternative perspectives. Um, but you definitely see efforts to delegitimize um, people who encourage this sort of, of approach as well. And so it's, um, it can be challenging, especially in, in places like Iran, where, where the state is so stridently opposed to this sort of development. Yeah, it's very interesting. And I'm, I'm really glad that you talked a lot about Julius Streicher. Um, it's a point that we bring up in the museum galleries often where you look at the propaganda that his publishing house produced in the 1930s and 40s and then seeing him um, tried at the Nuremberg trials and kind of having this moment where people can be held accountable for crimes against humanity based on words or based on uh, propaganda and not necessarily just pulling a trigger which is not what he literally did. Um, so I'm wondering if we see in the world today any sort of accountability for um, this sort of hate speech mm -hmm. coming from the Middle East, coming from these books, um, or, or even, I guess, there are some questions from the audience asking about ADL's role in removing anti-Semitism from social media, even here in the U.S. So I wonder if you could answer both um, what, if and what um, the global response to hate speech and the propagation of hate speech, if it's similar to the way it was at Nuremberg, if it's changed, if it's not really part of the conversation, and then also what are some roles that maybe ADL is doing to remove anti-Semitism from social media, both domestically and abroad? Sure, yeah. So the, um, you know, I, I think the, the Streicher case is, is particularly instructive in, in terms of if someone who was found guilty of incitement to genocide. And, and I think it's, it's a very rare example. Uh, there, there are very rarely consequences for, for hate speech and incitement of this sort. Um, in terms of very, very rarely um, punitive consequences for it. Um, the, the ADL wrote um, to the United Nations raising concern about um, rhetoric of this sort, um, I believe it was last month, um, by the Supreme Leader of Iran, who um, published a, an image. It was, a, it was a, a poster depicting Iranian-backed terrorist groups overrunning Jerusalem. And it, it, um, it called it the final solution, uh, which, which I don't think is coincidental language. Um, but, um, you know, the, the international community very rarely exerts consequences for these sorts of, this sort of conduct, which is, is I think part of where civil society and governments have a role to play to raise concern. Um, one notable example, the Palestinian authorities textbooks, um, which incite anti-Semitism and encourage violence are um, produced by a ministry of education that receives substantial international aid funding. Um, most notably from several European Union governments as well as from the EU as a whole. Um, so that's something that, that ADL and several of our partner organizations have been raising with those governments, not to say that we don't want them to support children learning, including Palestinian children um, learning, uh, but that we hope that these donor governments um, will be having very serious conversations about how their aid um, depends upon 
responsible conduct by governments um, to stop the, the teaching of that sort of incitement. Um, as for the, the social media question, um, there, there's a, a very compelling saying, which is that freedom of speech is not freedom of reach. Uh, in, in particular, social media platforms are private companies with terms of service, and um, no user has a, an unlimited right um, to, use, to be able to use those platforms to spread hateful messages. And so um, ADL and other organizations are engaged in long-running advocacy to try and encourage Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and other platforms to consistently apply robust terms of service to ensure that this sort of hate speech is not um, supercharged uh, by means of these sorts of platforms. That's really, I mean, it's, we're having a lot of conversations or questions, I should say, in the Q&A about sort of the roles in which we can play um, mm. limits, as you say, of free speech um, and, and hate speech and when those two things sort of cross one another. Um, and I know that there is, of course, the ADL put out a report the last few years about how anti-Semitism is growing in the United States. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you see any connection or influence between the anti-Semitism um, in the Mideast and also the anti-Semitism in the United States that's been um, growing in recent years and months. Mm. So the, the really interesting thing about um, rising anti-Semitism is that it, it it isn't uniformly rising, it's rising in really um, particular various ways. So um, ADL's longstanding polling about um, anti-Semitic beliefs or attitudes in the United States show a really interesting trend, which is that um, the, the numbers were on a downward trajectory for many, many years, um, and they've remained relatively low. Uh, and even in the last five, 10 years, those numbers haven't dramatically increased in terms of the proportion of American society that would um, agree with or, or um, adhere to these sorts of, of anti-Semitic um, beliefs or stereotypes. Um, what we have seen is a significant increase in anti-Semitic incidents in the United States, and especially um, a, a really enormous increase in anti-Semitic violence. And so what that, suggests um, is that, an, in, that a, a radical fringe is increasingly emboldened or increasingly successful in perpetrating violence um, and in, in having those violent incidents successfully lead to many deaths, uh, like in Pittsburgh or you know, other, other violent incidents uh, with significant impact. So, uh, and then internationally, we also see increases in, in certain ways, but not in others. So um, the incident trends really vary country to country, but there are significant upswings both in, in Western Europe as well as Eastern Europe, um, some places in Latin America uh, as well. Mm. Yeah. So how would you suggest, I guess, um, mm. how we in the Jewish community can address this anti-Semitism while also acknowledging the Islamophobia it can cause within the Jewish community. So sometimes we can hear people, whether you know, in the community or out of the community, make some Islamophobic remarks in defense of Judaism. So how do we um, kind of balance positivity, respect, and human dignity between the communities while also fighting anti-Semitism that's growing out of the Muslim countries in the Middle East? Sure. Um so I, I think, first of all, it, it's important for people to, to, to recognize um, my view and an ADL's view that anti-Semitism doesn't come from one community or one faith or one part of a political spectrum or one part of the world, right? It's, um, it has a long running history threaded through many parts of the world uh, and they, um, you know, and they get adapted to different parts of the world or different, different settings or different political communities um, based on different cir circumstances or, um, or um, narratives. And so, um, you know, in the same way that anti-Semitism isn't a conservative issue or a, or a liberal issue or, a, uh, you know, I don't think it's a Middle Eastern issue relative to a European one or just a 
something that is a, an issue involving some Christians or some Muslims. Um, I think encouraging um, people to, to have conversations about this, um, including with the, with the other is important. And so, um, you know, in the same way that I wouldn't want um, someone to make broad generalizations or judgments about Jewish people without meeting Jewish people or talking to Jewish people, I'd encourage Jewish people to meet Muslim people and not make generalizations about them, especially if they um, aren't having, you know, thoughtful, you know, humane conversations and dialogue in, in that way. Um, the other thing is, is that um, it's um, the, um, she's fighting it. Um, yeah, and the, and the more that people can um, collaborate uh, in these sorts of ways, I think is helpful. So I think in terms of the political side of things, the you know, left or right dimension of things, one of the most positive developments um, from ADL's point of view in, in the Congress in recent years has been the, the robust work of the bipartisan task force for combating anti-Semitism in the House of Representatives and the fact that with encouragement from us and, and some other groups, a similar one was created in the Senate. And so it, it, it helps ameliorate the um, political temptation um, to portray it as just one side of the aisle or just the other, or to, or to make the issue of fighting anti-Semitism um, a partisan one, because I think that makes it harder for everyone to collaborate against it. And with the same thing in terms of cooperating across faith lines, the more that um, we can cooperate with non-Jews, um, that Jews can cooperate with non-Jews in fighting anti-Semitism, the better in, in part because the Jews are a tiny minority of the world population and they're never going to be able to get rid of anti-Semitism without really committed allies in all parts of the world. Yeah, I think that's a, a good point. And I think what was so fascinating to me when you were discussing your points earlier is even the idea that the blood libel still exists and is being used as propaganda today when it dates back centuries um, and sort of was very much tied with Christian belief um, and, and stemming from Christian countries that were anti-Semitic for religious reasons. And so just the way in which anti-Semitic tropes are so clearly borrowed throughout mm -hmm. history and not necessarily a reflection of the Jewish community. I mean, as is most stereotypical propaganda and um, feelings. So it was just, it's shocking to me sometimes how hate can continue in such an obviously um, irrational and unrealistic way. So mm -hmm. I found that, and I think that's a, a really important point when you mentioned earlier that we have to come together for cross-cultural conversations because how do we expect people to be able to identify that anti-Semitism is false or the rhetoric they're hearing is false without meeting Jewish people or being introduced to Judaism. And the same can be said for what we were talking about earlier with um, Islamophobia is if you're not speaking with people of the Muslim faith and learning about Islam, then how are you gonna be able to recognize hate speech about it? Yeah. So I very much agree that it's important for all of us to, to do our parts in learning about other cultures and other heritages. If I could, if yeah. I could elaborate on that, I think, um, if, if we want to talk about good news stories, one of the most compelling ones is, is the development of um, where dialogue between the Catholic Church and the Jewish community has gone um, in recent decades. And both in terms of vociferously um, condemning um, things like the blood libel or, or collective blame for the death of Jesus, um, but, but really more broadly, um, the, the Catholic Church has, has made enormous steps um, in, in past decades to really not just not promote anti-Semitism, but to be truly outspoken from the level of the Pope on down saying, to be a good Christian, you need to fight anti-Semitism. Uh, and I, I think we're seeing some developments and some battle of this sort um, in the Middle East uh, as well today. Uh, in particular, um, the people who promote anti-Semitism often latch on, in that part of the world, will often latch on to negative anecdotes uh, or negative portrayals of anecdotes um, from Islamic scripture and from Islamic history and Islamic Jewish interaction. 
Um, and I, I think there's a really concerted effort among moderates uh, in some parts of the, of the region to really reclaim that, that historical heritage and to specifically use it to um, delegitimize those extremist applications of um, religious history, specifically for the purpose of fighting hate and bigotry of all kinds. So we see it with some of the efforts from the leader of, of the Muslim World League, which is linked to Saudi Arabia. Uh, we also see it through the leadership of something called the Muslim Council of Elders and the Forum for Promoting Peace in Muslim Societies out of the UAE. Um, they recently launched something called the, the Alliance of Virtue between Christian, Jewish, and Muslim faith leaders uh, for fighting um, anti-Semitism, anti-Christian, and anti-Muslim sentiment. And they, they issued their charter in December, and it's ADL, a number of ADL um, representatives signed on to it because we think it's, it's a really important development. And I, I think it reflects, you know, hopefully that same sort of trajectory um, if it can hopefully succeed. Are there any Israeli organizations um, or public figures who are involved in those as well? So there were um, there were prominent um, is there were Israelis at that um, event. Um, the um, I think one of the the most interesting developments there, in particular in the UAE, is that for Dubai um, Expo 20, um, 2020, they were supposed to be, uh, which was going to go forward this year, but has been postponed because of the pandemic. Um, they had overturned the rules against uh, visas for um, Israeli civilian visitors. Now, Israeli athletes and government officials and others have been going there for several years now in some positive ways, but this was going to be a broader opening up. And, and uh, you know, hopefully in the next year, we'll see that expanded in a broader way to really enable the people to people engagement to, to expand in some positive ways. Um, I know there's a, a few questions that are in the Q&A, mm -hmm. more kind of looking at the recent social movements here in the United States yeah. um, and very much the focus of many on social media and in the news on the Black Lives Matter movement and, and discussing racial inequity in this country. And I'm wondering if you see any sorts of um, conversations that could be had where we talk about anti-Semitism in a way that doesn't detract from the Black Lives Matter movement or even sort of ways in which Jews can discuss um, you know, their belief in racial equity in the US without mm -hmm. getting bogged down with the anti-Israel stance mm -hmm. that um, sometimes is associated with criticisms of Black Lives Matter and kind of this, this tangled web. Yeah. I'm sure it, it takes a lot more than just you to untangle it, but I was wondering if you could speak to that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so ADL was founded over a century ago with, with a dual mission, and it was to combat the defamation of the Jewish people and to, to advocate for justice and fair treatment for all. And I, and I think that's something that was then and is still a widely supported principle um, by the Jewish American community. And, um, you know, we, we've seen it with statements of support from broad spectrum of, of um, the mainstream Jewish American community in, respo in response to calls for um, combating discrimination. Uh, and and I, I think um, the, um, the general focus of uh, ensuring that all lives, um, all people are treated, you know, equal fair treatment under the law um, in the way that the, the Black Lives Movement um, generally calls for, I think is something that there's very clear support from the Jewish American community for. The, the issue of Israel is, is where things get more tense. And part of that is because of how some elements or some subgroups in the Black Lives Matter movement have expressed positions with regard to Israel um, that, that many of us in the Jewish American community would disagree with. Um, the movement for Black Lives, I believe is the, is the subgroup, has on its platform describing that Israel, saying Israel is, is a perpetrator of genocide and, and some other problematic um, language that, that ADL sees as, or I would see as problematic there. Um, but there's a really instructive um, parallel here, um, which is actually how the Jewish community dealt with the uh, approached issues of, of extremists 
or, ex or extreme views um, in the movement for Soviet Jewry. Now, one of the most prominent voices in that movement was Mayor Kahane, you know, an out and out bigot committed to violence um, whose supporters engaged in really acts of terrorism. Um, but that didn't mean that the movement for Soviet Jewry was a violent movement. And it didn't mean that the movement for Soviet Jewry um, was a bigoted movement. Uh, and by that same token, I, I think um, applying a litmus test to an entire movement for social justice based on the views of some of its members or some of its groups or some of its um, figures, I think is, does it a service to our own community's principles if we're, if we're you know, applying it in a, in a non, uh, if we're exaggerating the extent to which those viewpoints are representative of what a movement stands for. Uh, and so, um, you know, the extent to which the issue of, of combating anti-Semitism pertains, you know, it's, it's very important for us to be having dialogue with, with all communities uh, on the issue of bigotry, including the issue of anti-Semitism, right? And, and the deep historical roots and the longstanding sort of staying power of these myths um, not just in one community um, or not just from one side of a political spectrum, I think highlights the importance of positive education to offset these myths and positive engagement. And so to the extent to which there can be really constructive conversations with all communities um, around this, I think is, is really important. Um, but it's, you know, often it is there's a really great saying from, I think it's the Washington director of the NAACP that to be a friend, to have a friend, you need to be a friend. Uh, and to the extent to which we want to engage communities in serious conversations about anti-Semitism and how it, how it manifests, um, I think it's, it's only fair for them to ask of us the same thing. It really sounds like you have a plan for us to heal the world and, and make it better. I mean, it's so inspiring to hear from you and kind of know that this is the leadership that we are looking for in communities to end all forms of bigotry and hatred and racism, because those things don't happen in a vacuum. And oftentimes, it's not just one group that's being targeted, but many groups that are forced into being scapegoats. And it's up to the larger community, like you say, to, um, you know, have a friend, and you also have to be a friend. And I think it's important for allyship and to stand up for others. And I know that earlier, so you definitely, you told us all that we need to get better educated. You told us all that we need to um, learn about others and kind of ex and face ourselves a little bit more. And I know you mentioned that speaking up in, to our representatives in government is also very important. Um, I mean, is there anything, any role that the State Department has done? Is there any hope that our government can do more? Um, what would you recommend for people who kind of want to get involved on that political level? I know you're in DC, so you're very much aware of how politics can be powerful. So I'm wondering if you have any sort of um, tidbits for those of us in LA watching. Sure. You know, I, without getting into, uh, into the weeds too much, the, I think the State Department and Congress um, across you know, numerous sessions of Congress and numerous administrations have been interested to try and address these sorts of issues, um, but it just gets subsumed in you know, the news cycle and all kinds of diplomatic crises of the day and what have you. So to the extent to which you and your audiences are engaged in conversation with public officials or representatives who are engaged in foreign affairs or raising concern about these sorts of things, just saying, you know, we're really concerned about hate and we're really concerned about anti-Semitism and anti-Semitic incitement, including in these, you know, we just attended this lecture and you know, these are some examples from the Middle East, but to, and, and in general, you know, what, what are you doing and what is the government doing to, um, to really tackle that? I, I think hearing from the community that this is something that matters, not, you know, something that should displace everything else, but something that should be a priority helps. And kind of as we're sort of wrapping up and I wanna open it to see if you have any last sort of comments that you wanna share or insights. Um, I guess, are you optimistic or pessimistic about the situation over the next five to 10 years? Um, and why mm. is that? Yes, 
yes to both, right? I mean, there are the, the persistence of these sorts of tropes and, and propaganda is you know, deeply painful and scary and, and not something that we can um, you know, wish away. Uh, but at the same time, I think there are people of goodwill on all sides of um, the world and all sides of political issues who want to do right and want to do the right thing and want to fight hate. And so to the extent to which we can have, you know, robust, informed um, engagement on these sorts of issues and really collaborate with people to fight this kind of anti-Semitism, um, I think there are people who are willing to do it. And, and I, I think it's, it's a matter of going ahead and, and actually doing the work. Wonderful. Um, thank you so much, David, for sharing with us today and instructing us, educating us, leaving us feeling inspired to really make changes. Uh, I think that it was an eye-opening experience, especially coming from Holocaust history, to see, and to, as a reminder for all of us, that these moments in history do not exist in a vacuum. Hatred is clearly something that is taught. We are not born hating. And it's truly up to us to combat um, those instructions and to, to really think, you know, how is hatred of a group that might not even be my own group detrimental to the larger community and to myself? So thank you for not only sharing the history and the connections, but also things that we can do to make a difference. Um, I don't know if you want to say any final words before we wrap up, or if you had a last point that was super important to put out there. Just, just thank you and, and thank you everybody for taking time to, to talk about um, fighting, fighting hate of this sort. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Um, and right before we sign off, I want to invite everyone to join us again for, our, for many of our future programs, but we have one tomorrow, uh, Tuesday, July 14th. Please join us for the second in a monthly series, Building Bridges, in partnership with the Jewish Center for Justice, the Los Angeles Urban League, um, Hispanics Organized for Political Equity, and the Center for Asian Americans United for Self-Empowerment. Uh, our museum board member, Dan Schnur, will moderate a discussion with the leaders of those organizations about the results of our, the new California community poll that came out, which is on topics including race relations, discrimination, and the impact of COVID-19. Even if you don't live in California, we definitely invite you to join because I think it's a a topic or a few topics that are, are impacting all of us throughout the country. Um, you can always find more information about all of our virtual events on our museum website, lamoth.org. Uh, the museum provides online programs like today's at no charge. If you enjoyed our, our program or if you felt that it was meaningful and informative in some way, please consider supporting our important work by making a donation. Thank you again, Dr. David Weinberg uh, to ADL for for lending us to you and for co-sponsoring this program and to everyone joining us today. Take care, stay healthy, and we hope to see you soon.